I imagine that you all have images of Robert Frost and actual images in your mind uh, when, you, uh, when, you, when you think of this, this poet. He's a familiar face in American literature. Uh, and I, I gathered some of them that seemed representative. Uh, here, here is, this is Frost in, in old age as an American bard from uh, a magazine. Uh, this, is, this is the Frost that you probably know as if he were born with white hair, right? Uh, and uh, a kind of, uh, well, kindly uh, and uh, monumental uh, and yet approachable uh, figure uh, that uh, is familiar from American schoolrooms. Uh, here's a, another image of that same guy, <coughs> Robert Frost, painted by Grandma Cox, uh, uh, reminding us of, of Frost as a kind of link to 19th century life, uh, to, uh, to rural Vermont. Uh, another, uh, another image of Frost, this one from the Times, just a little story. Uh, President Hale's bond with Frost, that president would be John F. Kennedy. Uh, on TV, he extols poet uh, who calls New Frontier Age of Poetry and Power. Uh, and perhaps you have uh, seen images of, of Frost reading uh, his poem, The Gift Outright, at Kennedy's inauguration. Uh, it was a kind of powerful moment in American culture where uh, the president allied himself with poetry uh, in this way. <coughs> uh, oh, more pictures. This is, you know, Frost with grandchildren, Frost with his pet calves. <laughs> he was kind to animals. Uh, uh, and a, a farmer. <coughs> uh, this one I like. This is Frost with a stick. Uh, <laughs> uh, or, or Frost with a branch. You can think about that. Uh, when you read Birch's, <coughs> uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, uh, Frost boyish even in age. Uh, Frost uh, who also likes to play and even who looks just a little bit, don't you think, malevolent. <coughs> uh, all of these images would seem to make Frost not a modern poet at all. <coughs> not a modern poet in the sense that Eliot and Pound established. That is, a difficult poet in ways that I suggested last Wednesday. Uh, a poet resistant to ordinary language and common frames of reference, uh, formally innovative, disorienting, urbane, metropolitan. I think of 19th century art as, as being horizontal uh, and, and you know, stretched out uh, uh, like uh, uh, agricultural life in New England. Uh, and Modernism is all about verticality uh, from a certain angle. This is uh, the Stieglitz uh, picture, City of Ambition, I showed you last, uh, last Wednesday. Uh, another pairing, uh, this, this uh, wonderful uh, landscape by Martin Johnson Heed. And we could contrast it with uh, these images of Brooklyn Bridge by Walker Evans. Where even underneath the bridge, the bridge seems to, you know, a, a, a uh, figure of crossing uh, seems here to rise up uh, and out of um, uh, the uh, the city and the river. Uh, this is this is Frost before he had white hair. Uh, Frost at at 18, uh, which is I, I believe uh, uh, 1892 or so. Uh, boyish. And his, his first book uh, is, is entitled A Boy's Will. Uh, a Boy's Will, Robert Frost. This is a cover of the first edition that you can go over to Beinecke and see. When you, when you open it up and look at the table of contents, you see uh, titles of poems. Uh, and underneath those titles are little legends uh, and moralizations. Uh, into my own title. Uh, legend, the youth is persuaded that he will be rather more than less himself for having forsworn the world. Uh, or, uh, storm fear, he is afraid of his own isolation. Uh, uh, these are, these are, are, are poems, in other words, that uh, 
you know, come with, with little labels to tell you what they mean and what they're about. <coughs> uh, Modernism in Eliot and, and Pound is in, in some ways is, is founded on expatriation, on, on, on uh, a kind of internationalism. Frost's poetry seems resolutely American, or uh, at any rate, it seems to be. There is, in fact, uh, another Frost, a modern and modernist Frost, uh, a Frost that is, in fact, as international uh, as Pound and Eliot, uh, who began uh, uh, his career, in fact, uh, beside them as a London expatriate. This is, uh, this, this is more of the table of contents. You can see how it's laid out. <coughs> uh, this, is, this is the uh, Frost who published that book. Uh, this is Frost at 39. Uh, Frost in uh, a suit made by a London tailor uh, in London. <coughs> Uh, and when we go to the title page of A Boy's Will, we see that uh, this uh, New England poet publishes his first book, in fact, in London uh, in 1913, uh, there on New Oxford Street. <coughs> Interesting. North of Boston, uh, a uh, great uh, book that, that follows A Boy's Will. Uh, 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 it's, you know, is, a, is a title that locates these poems in a specific place in uh, northern New England. Uh, it, too, uh, is published uh, in London, uh, this time uh, on Bloomsbury Street. You don't really think of Frost as part of Bloomsbury, do you? Uh, but there he is publishing his book uh, in that place, just like Prufrock. Uh, also published on Bloomsbury Street, uh, this in 1917, uh, north of Boston in 1915. Uh, you remember that table of contents page I showed you a moment ago with the titles and the moralizations that uh, uh, Frost has for a boy's will. Well, um, here's, the, here's the, the modernist table of contents of, of proof rock, and of course, we know, well, what would the legend for the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock be? He wanders around in a melancholy way, quoting Hamlet for, well, no, it, 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 uh, uh, Eliot didn't do that. <coughs> uh, when we look at the table of contents of this book, which is north of Boston, well, it looks a lot like Eliot's. Uh, those, those little uh, tags that ex seem to explain the poetry. Uh, have disappeared, and instead we simply have uh, the titles of these very great poems, Mending Wall, The Death of the Hired Man, The Mountain, uh, Home Burial. <coughs> uh, there's something uh, in, in uh, Eliot's, the presentation of Eliot's work, and indeed in the work itself, that is affronting, resistant, uh, impersonal, uh, and the typography, the presentation of the book uh, is part of that. Um, <coughs> it, it's, it's part of uh, Eliot's whole uh, aesthetic. Uh, but uh, North of Boston, well, you know, uh, when we start looking at these two books together, it s seems to share some of the properties of, of Eliot's book uh, and indeed the poems that we find when we um, open that book uh, also have, have things in common with Eliot's. The other Frost, uh, not the simple, uh, familiar, monumental Frost, but the Frost who is a modernist poet who begins writing in London, uh, is really quite as cosmopolitan, quite as learned uh, as, as Pound and Eliot at this moment, uh, and yet he uses his learning uh, differently. He uses it very often by concealing it, <coughs> in fact. Well. <coughs> Let me turn from pictures to text. On your uh, handout today, the handout number two, uh, we have, uh, well, there's several quotations from uh, Frost's letters. And uh, let's look at the, the first one first. Uh, Frost says, uh, at the time that he's publishing A Boy's Will, 
uh, to a friend, uh, you mustn't take me too seriously if I now proceed to brag a bit about my exploits as a poet. There is one qualifying fact always to bear in mind. There is a kind of success called of esteem, <laughs> and it butters no parsnips. Uh, it means a success with the critical few who are supposed to know. But really, to arrive where I can stand on my legs as a poet and nothing else, I must get outside that circle to the general reader who buys books in their thousands. I may not be able to do that. I believe in doing it. Don't you doubt me there. I want to be a poet for all sorts and kinds. I could never make a merit of being caviar to the crowd the way my quasi-friend Pound does. <laughs> I want to reach out and would if I were a thing I could do, if it were a thing I could do by taking thought. <coughs> well, <coughs> Frost wishes to be so subtle as to seem altogether obvious. <coughs> uh, it's not just that he seems obvious but is really subtle. Rather, his subtlety shows itself in his deliberate concealment of it, in the ways in which he masks himself in obviousness. The problems that, that Frost's poetry poses for us as, as readers are not problems of reference. Uh, they can't be solved by footnotes. Compare the footnotes uh, in the Frost poems to the footnotes uh, in, in the Norton that you find next to uh, Eliot uh, or, or Pound's poems. <coughs> the problems that Frost poses are problems of interpretation, uh, problems that provoke you to ask not what does he mean exactly, uh, but how does he mean that? Uh, is he joking or is he serious? Is there something on his mind that he's not saying? The wonder of Frost is, is really in his tone, his way of saying things without saying them in so many words. Now, uh, this guile of his, uh, because that's what it entails, this guile is something temperamental, I think. It came naturally to him. Uh, but it also reflects a specific literary situation. The popular old-fashioned Frost and the elite modern Frost, these roles point to a, a, a division in the audiences for poetry that emerges clearly in this period. Uh, the, the Frost who uh, writes a familiar crafted lyric that would have been easily recognizable as poetry uh, and, and that we could give a little tag to after its title, uh, well, contrast this with uh, 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 the poet of the wasteland, uh, say, uh, whose work uh, would not have been recognizable to uh, uh, many readers as poetry uh, and indeed was not. <coughs> Uh, on one level, Frost was spoke for and to uh, an audience trained by the genteel poetry of late 19th century America, readers who loved Longfellow, uh, the fireside poets, uh, uh, poets who published in Victorian popular magazines and wrote those gilt embossed books that uh, cultured families kept behind glass bookcases and that you can still find at tag sales on uh, New England Greens. That's the obvious Frost, the one that the subtle Frost in many ways constructed, uh, aiming all the time not at a general reader at all but at an elite reader of the new tiny circulation little magazines where uh, the work of Eliot, Williams, Stevens, Moore, and others uh, were first published. Those magazines I showed you last week, magazines like Broom or Blast or uh, Rogue or The Criterion. Uh, Frost, uh, there's duplicity in Frost's poetry uh, and there's, uh, there's a certain doubleness in the uh, um, uh, figure that he projects uh, as a poet. Uh, I like to think of his obsession with double meanings, <coughs> which he has. As, as, a, as a way of responding uh, to a division in culture between popular and elite readers, uh, a division that he saw as expressive of um, uh, a division in American culture between, well, 
money and esteem, business and art. Uh, in that quotation I, I read for you uh, um, a few moments ago, uh, Frost opposes two kinds of success. One of esteem, uh, that success with the critical few that butters no parsnips. <coughs> you can see he brings in the kind of folksy term to, uh, well, to what? To uh, uh, disdain that kind of uh, success or put it in its place. And on the other hand, a success with the general reader who buys books in their thousands. <coughs> uh, Frost wanted both. The opposition is between poetry that makes money <coughs> and poetry that precisely, because it is good poetry as modern poetry defines it, does not. <coughs> uh, notice that the latter kind of poetry, the good kind that, that butters no, no parsnips, uh, is associated here with Frost's quasi-friend Pound. Uh, instead of butter, Pound writes caviar. <coughs> uh, you know, a kind of a European thing, right? Uh, caviar. Uh, by contrast, uh, Frost is declaring his ambition to reach out to a large audience. Uh, it is for, for Frost a frankly economic ambition. <coughs> by becoming a poet for all sorts and kinds, Frost intends, as he says, to arrive where I can stand on my legs as a poet and nothing else. Uh, this, is, this is an ambition for a, a career, uh, but it's also a, a desire for personal autonomy. For Frost, poetry is invested with a, with a longing for autonomy in, in, well, both simple and complex sen senses. He wants to use poetry to stand on his own two legs. <coughs> He sees it specifically, and this is important, as a form of work that will allow him to be self-sufficient and self-determining. Frost was born in 1874 into a working family. Uh, his father's death when Frost was a boy represented, among other things, an economic crisis for his family. <coughs> Frost's schooling was erratic. This is impressive. He dropped out of both Dartmouth and Harvard. <coughs> uh, and he did so uh, to take laboring jobs, uh, each time enacting a conflict between intellectual life and manual labor that would be a persistent and central theme of his poetry. He worked at all sorts of jobs, uh, in factories, <coughs> a mill on a newspaper. He was a school teacher. Uh, and, of course, he was a farmer, too. Uh, when his grandfather gave him a farm to work, which he did, for ten years in Derry, New Hampshire, uh, it's in fact at the end of this period that Frost moved himself and his family to England uh, in a last-ditch bid to make literary contacts and advance his career as a poet. It was first in England that Frost published the books that established his reputation as the pasture poet of New England, uh, a poet whose authority seemed to rest on his being rooted in his region. <coughs> Once he returned to New England in 1916, after north of Boston, success followed on success. <coughs> Poetry was a way for Frost out of manual labor. But it was also a form of work for Frost that was opposed to manual labor. It was an escape from it, a way of transcending it, but also uh, in many ways allied to it, valuable because it could be a form of productive labor, something he could use to butter his parsnips. Uh, these concerns that I'm, I'm laying out all inform his poetry. Uh, they, they structure Frost's work as a poet and his ongoing inquiry into that work. Frost's poems perform a kind of phenomenology of work, of labor. They say what it is like to work at something. In so doing, uh, they are always also brooding on what it is like to read and write poems. Uh, this is the case with mowing, <coughs> uh, which is in your packet from RIS uh, and uh, uh, is an example of one of these Frostian poems about work. Uh, 
Let me read it for you. There was never a sound beside the wood but one, and that was my long scythe whispering to the ground. What was it it whispered? I knew not well myself. Perhaps it was something about the heat of the sun, something, perhaps, about the lack of sound, and that was why it whispered and did not speak. It was no dream of the gift of idle hours or easy gold at the hand of fay or elf. Anything more than the truth would have seemed too weak to the earnest love that laid the swale in rows, not without feeble pointed spikes of flowers, pale orchises, and scared a bright green snake. The fact is the sweetest dream that labor knows. My long scythe whispered and left the hay to make. This is a, a, a monologue by a, a worker. A mower. <coughs> uh, it is a sonnet, too. <coughs> it's a sort of song of song of a worker. Uh, <coughs> Notice that Frost is interested at once in the presence of a sound, the sound of a solitary worker. Uh, or, to be more precise, the sound of the tool of the worker. <coughs> the sound is the sign of his work. And it raises a specifically uh, interpretive question. What is the message of the work that the man does? What is, its, what is it saying? What is its meaning? What was it it whispered? The scythe is one of many tools in Frost. Uh, I asked you to pay attention to, to tools in his, his poetry as you read it over the weekend. To work in Frost is to use a tool. Tools mediate the worker's relation to the world. Uh, uh, it's what the worker uses to do things uh, and to make things. Things are not made up in Frost, uh, not made up in the sense of imagined, called up out of thin air like fairies and elves. Uh, instead, things in Frost are, are made in the sense of constructed. They're the products of specific acts, uh, the acts of, of a worker. Uh, think of, of other tools in those poems. Uh, there's the, the spade in Home Burial. Uh, the spade that's used to bury the couple's little child. I'll talk more about that poem next time. There's the, uh, the ladder to heaven in after apple picking. Uh, it's a ladder, you know, uh, used to um, ascend a tree. It's a, it's a kind of tool of ascent. It's a kind of tool for getting fruit. Uh, and then there's the, the terrible chainsaw in Out, Out. Uh, in mowing, the scythe makes a sound as it cuts, uh, and that sound is delicate. It's, a, it's quiet. It whispers. But cutting is something fearful and forceful. It's a kind of controlled violence. Uh, Frost takes it for granted that we will uh, remember that the scythe is a conventional image for time, which harvests all of us through death. Time and death, uh, these are the, the forces that the uh, worker works against uh, and tries to marshal uh, in, in uh, the process of working his will in the world, to make his way in it, to earn his living, to stand on his own two feet. But these, these forces are, are not something that uh, the man uh, controls uh, as, a, as a simple extension of himself. Tools in Frost are, are, are tricky. You have to learn how to use them. They have in Frost a kind of uh, independent 
objective existence. Uh, remember out, out. This is, if, if you, you look on page 213 and you're, you're Norton, uh, well, I'll, I'll read from the middle of the, the poem. Uh, boy is out uh, sawing. Uh, his sister stood beside them, the group. He's not alone. He's with others. In her apron to tell them supper. At the word, the saw, as if to prove saws knew what supper meant, leaped out at the boy's hand, or seemed to leap. He must have given the hand. However it was, neither refused the meeting but the hand. The boy's first outcry was a rueful laugh as he swung toward them, holding up the hand, half in appeal, but half as if to keep the life from spilling. Then the boy saw all, since he was old enough to know, big boy doing a man's work. Though a child at heart, he saw all spoiled. Don't let them cut my hand off, the doctor, when he comes. Don't let them, sister. So. But the hand was already gone, and the boy dies. Uh, it's an it's a, a extraordinarily powerful poem. Uh, this saw, rather than whispering, it snarls and rattles. Uh, ultimately, it takes the life of the worker. It reminds the worker that uh, uh, it has the power of death, the force that the worker only accesses through the tool. Although uh, Frost's tools give the worker a way to impose his will on the world, the tool is part of the object world, and it declares here brutally and cruelly that the worker's will is limited and subject to the tools he uses. In mowing, the poem's lines are like sweeps of the scythe as it lays down rows of swale. Frost wants us to think about that. He wants us to see the, the, row, the harvested rows as being like lines of verse. It's an ancient uh, association uh, from classical poetry. The word swale is interesting. Uh, you hear in it the S and the W, uh, the two key sounds of this poem, uh, which are the sounds of the whispering scythe. Frost loves verbal sounds, uh, and he loves to play with their metaphorical associations. He invites us to hear the, the sweep of the scythe in those S sounds themselves, I think, and maybe even to hear the workers huff and puff. Uh, his rhythmic exhalation in the W's, which alternate and interact with those S's. The whisper of the scythe, then. This is what the poem is all about. The whisper is not, Frost specifies, a dream of the gift of idle hours. Poetry is not, that is to say, a leisure class activity. Frost is, is writing against the romantic idea that poetry is written in repose, received passively as inspiration. Poetry in Frost is action, uh, not a matter, as, as Wordsworth would say, of emotion recollected in tranquility. <coughs> Frost is also here specifically writing against the early poetry of Yeats, which you'll read next week. <coughs> Uh, poetry that, that finds reality exactly in dream and that has plenty of fairies and elves in it. Uh, fro uh, Frost is not after easy gold, but rather hard-earned wages. <coughs> uh, dream. Uh, here Frost implies that it is something, dream is something more than the truth. He has that, that phrase, Anything more than the truth would have seemed too weak to the earnest love that laid the swale in rows. Uh, that's an interesting phrase, more than the truth. Why not less? Why isn't dream less than the truth? Uh, Frost has made a suggestive choice of words. Truth is something less than dream in Frost. Truth is 
life-sized. Uh, to get down to it, you have to cut away what is not true, what is uh, inflated, beside the point, uh, excess ornament. The truth is something that you get down to. Uh, the truth is a reduction, a simplification. Uh, it is what is fit for the earnest love that is working for truth. Love. This is a crucial word in Frost. You don't think of Frost as a, as a love poet. Uh, there are love poems in Frost. Uh, uh, and yet, um, uh, even apart from those, there are many poems that use that word, love, often in uh, crucial places in the poems. Uh, in fact, love and, and desire are really at the center of Frost's poetry. Uh, so far, I've been stressing a kind of anti-romantic side of Frost. Uh, uh, how he seems to be saying nothing but the facts, please. But the fact, he says in that next to last line, is the sweetest dream of labor. And it is earnest love that is doing this cutting. Labor loves, labor dreams. When we look carefully at this poem, in fact, the distinction that Frost seems to make between fact and dream starts to give way. Let me go back to the sound of this work. What was it it whispered? Note Frost's use of words like something and perhaps. Uh, these are words you're not supposed to use in, in poems or, or, or in even writing about poems. <coughs> uh, in, in Frost, there is here this uh, uh, explicit, deliberate, calculated vagueness, uh, a, a withholding of certainty uh, that allows a, a range of possible meanings to be entertained, held open. It's a, it's a rhetorical and conceptual move that I think is analogous to the whispering of the scythe. Uh, what I mean is, is that uh, this tool doesn't speak loudly. It whispers, uh, and you have to lean forward to hear it. The same is true with the poem, with any Frost poem, uh, except that line 13 seems to violate that. Uh, it seems to violate that principle. The fact is the sweetest dream that labor knows. Well, here Frost seems to be spelling things out, making a declaration, making a statement, saying what the fact is, uh, and seeming to celebrate the literal. Uh, the fact is the sweetest dream that labor knows. Importantly, though, that's not the last thing the poem says. Uh, what difference would it make had Frost, as he could have, I suppose, have reversed the order of lines 13 and 14. Uh, line 13 stands out as if almost as if out of the poem, uh, as if out of time, as a, as a kind of fact or truth, a fixed principle uh, that is stated in a kind of eternal present. The fact is, like no other sentence in this poem, had Frost decided to end the poem there, uh, he would have said or seemed to be saying, this is what it's all about. It would, it would be like one of those morals uh, following the, the, the titles of his poem. But in fact, he doesn't end there. Uh, he doesn't make so clear a declaration. Line 14 returns us to the work of mowing. My long scythe whispered and left the hay to make. Returns us to the work of uh, mowing and the work of reading uh, and interpretation and deciphering. The poem ends uh, with an image of process and, and not of product, uh, an image of the process of labor. The implication is that it is the same way for the poet who lays the, uh, his words in, in rows, <coughs> Uh, in those, those uh, rows of swale that are his lines of verse. The hay, that is, well, what? The payoff? <laughs> uh, what the poem is all about, what mowing is all about, 
uh, the hay isn't handed over to you. Uh, it's rather left to make. Uh, that's a rich phrase. What Frost gives you here and elsewhere is a poetry that leaves its meanings to make all the time. Frost's poetry is engaged in uh, construing, constructing, constituting facts, which means it doesn't give us the truth as if it were a product, uh, a fashioned object. Rather, it gives us a, a process, an act of fashioning, an act that is involved with dreams and desire and with love. Facts are, are made and not found in, in Frost's poetry of work. And this is to say that the process by which facts are made is, uh, well, it's like work and is therefore, um, well, it's something daily, <coughs> ordinary, ongoing, and for these reasons, incompletable. Uh, it's something that we have to do over and over again, that is, making up the world. Poetry is a response to the daily necessity of getting the world right. Stevens said that, but Frost could have said it too. Uh, meaning in Frost's poems, uh, as in the world that they evoke, uh, has to be interpreted every day. It has to be, in that sense, worked for again and again. Well, let me use this poem as a, uh, as a way into now talking about sound in more actual, <laughs> more, more literal uh, ways uh, in Frost's poetry uh, and to uh, begin with you to think a little bit about meter, uh, in fact, and what Frost does with it. Uh, let me go back to the handout where we've got more passages from uh, Frost's letters, uh, and uh, in particular, <coughs> what Frost has to say about something he calls the sound of sense, Al although he says in that first quotation that, well, he, he doesn't like to brag. I alone of English writers have consciously set myself to make music out of what I may call the sound of sense. <coughs> he, this is an ambitious guy. <coughs> uh, now it is possible to have sense without the sound of sense, as in much prose that is supposed to pass muster but makes very dull reading, and the sound of sense without sense, as in Alice in Wonderland, which makes anything but dull reading. This is a wonderful metaphor. The best place to get the abstract sound of sense is from voices behind a door that cuts off the words. You understand what Frost means? I mean, he's, he, he wants us to think about how we could understand what people are saying without uh, taking in the words that they're using, <laughs> simply uh, by catching the tones and rhythms of their exchanges. The sound of sense, then, you get that. It is the abstract vitality of our speech. It is pure sound, pure form. One who concerns himself with it more than the subject is an artist. But remember, we're still talking merely of the raw material of poetry. An ear and an appetite for these sounds of sense is the first qualification of a writer, be it of prose or verse. But if one is to be a poet, he must learn to get cadences by skillfully breaking the sounds of sense with all their irregularity of accent across the regular beat of the meter. Verse in which there is nothing but the beat of the meter furnished by the accents of the polysyllabic words we call doggerel. Verse is not that. Neither is, the, is it the sound of sense alone. It is the resultant from those two. There are only two or three meters that are worth anything. Uh, we depend for variety on the infinite play of accents in the sound of sense. 
Frost's sound of, sound of sense, uh, the abstract vitality of our speech. It has to do exactly with how people say what they say. These are, are uh, dimensions of communication that I've been identifying in mowing with the whisper of the sigh. That is a tone of meaning or a way of meaning. Uh, the sound of sense, it represents uh, a common, common and vernacular elements of speech. The sounds of sense are all part of language in use, uh, which people are using to do things with. But Frost stresses, uh, poetry is not only that, it's something more. It's the sound of sense, as he says, broken. And that's another interesting metaphor. It's broken, he says, skillfully across the beat of the meter. Uh, meter is something regular. It's a fixed scheme. It's inflexible, as Frost conceives of it here. The speaking voice, by contrast, is something idiosyncratic, irregular, particular. Uh, in the second quotation, uh, or rather the last on the page, but the second one about the subject, um, Frost says, uh, <clears throat> my versification seems to bother people more than I should have expected, because he seemed to ears tutored uh, in 19th century norms to have a kind of uh, uh, rough and uh, irregular uh, um, metric. I suppose because I have been so long accustomed to thinking of it in my own private way. It is as simple as this. There are the very regular pre-established accent and measure of blank verse, blank verse, that is, and I'll explain it, uh, unrhymed iambic pentameter. And there are the very irregular accent and measure of speaking intonation. I am never more pleased than when I can get these into strained relation. Frost wants to create a sound effect of strained relation in his poetry, uh, where a strained relation between speech and meter. I like to, and, and again the same word, I like to drag and break the intonation across the meter as waves first comb and then break, stumbling on the shingle, and now I'm writing a poem, it seems. Uh, that's all, he says, but it's no mere figure of speech, though one can make figures enough about it. Uh, and in fact, uh, you can see Frost doing that in his poetry very often. Uh, strained relation. This tension between speech and pattern uh, suggests the tension between all sorts of contending forces in Frost, the vernacular and the literary, the concrete and the abstract, flux, fixity, the individual will and material fact. The special sound of Frost's poems uh, results from the tensions between these pairs of opposing forces as they are embodied in his language. Uh, to approach this, uh, you'll need to know a little bit about meter. Uh, in fact, a, a rough grasp on traditional English meter is, is essential to Frost, and it's also important to other poets we'll read, to Stevens, say, uh, or to Crane, or to Auden, or Bishop. Uh, obviously, these are, these are our, our poets uh, uh, who, who work uh, usually in, in uh, quite traditional meters. And yet it's also important uh, for reading Pound, and for reading Eliot, and for reading Moore, uh, who sound the way they do uh, partly because they make a point of not writing pentameter, <coughs> the meter that Frost often, but not always, chooses. Uh, how many uh, of you know what iambic pentameter is? Don't be shy. Let's see. I, I said it was, uh, okay. Um, I'm going to spend a little bit of time at the beginning of, of class next time uh, talking about it and, and uh, working with you uh, a little bit uh, as we um, uh, read um, uh, Frost. In particular, we can, we can use the poem Birches uh, to, to do that. 
Uh, don't be distressed if you're unfamiliar with it. Uh, um, knowing uh, what uh, iambic pentameter is is, is not a, a, a gift of birth, uh, but rather uh, something that comes through a little bit of practice, uh, which means you have to work at it a little bit. Uh, and I will, in order to enable you to do that, uh, give you uh, a, uh, well, or I'll actually ask the, the TFs in section to uh, hand out uh, a meter exercise that you can do for next week. Um, when, uh, when you leave today, uh, I would like to uh, collect uh, cards just to figure out how many of us there are. Um, and uh, as I say, on Wednesday, uh, between the online um, registration uh, and um, uh, our um, uh, work on it in uh, class, we should be able to get our sections ordered. So see you on Wednesday.